legacy. Also, why is there no check on hate speech? This on a day when a BJP MP Parvesh Varma caught on camera calling for the economic boycott of a community. Among our newsmakers, Asaduddin Owaisi will join us. But first, as always, it's time for the nine headlines at nine tonight. It's the end of an era. Netaji, the man who crafted a caste consolidation that erased the Congress from Uttar Pradesh, a three-time chief minister of the state, Mulayam Singh Yadav, passes away at 82. The Samajwadi Party's Supremo funeral will be held tomorrow. The War of the Sainiks. Eknath Shinde's faction to be called Bala Saibachi Shiv Sena Uddhav's party to be called Shiv... Uddhav Barasaib Thakre gets the Mashal symbol. Arson, vandalism and violence. Communal clashes rock. Bengal's Mominpur area near Kolkata. The BJP protests. Party seeks deployment of central forces to stop riots. 38 people detained so far. Ahead of elections, political temperatures soar in Gujarat. Prime Minister on the campaign trail says urban Naxals will not succeed in destroying the state, refers to Kejriwal indirectly. A day after a two-time BJP MP, Parvesh Varma is found on tape calling for an economic boycott against a community, a reference to Muslims, no action yet. BJP silent, OAC calls it a war against Muslims. Supreme Court refuses to revoke the ban on firecrackers, says the order stands clear on complete prohibition of cracker sale and production till 2023. RBI sells dollars via state-run banks after rupee falls to a fresh record low of 82.34 paise. The Indian currency finally closes at its Friday level of 82.32. Trouble mounts for the film Adi Purush. Legal notice sent to the producer and actors of the film for hurting the spiritual sentiments of Hindus. Massive escalation in Russia-Ukraine war. Missiles rain on Kiev after blast on the Crimean bridge. Putin chairs a security meet. Zelensky looks for G7 support. But to the big breaking news right at the very top, the Uttar Thakre faction of the Shiv Sena has got the torch mashal symbol. That's right, it's now going to be called the Shiv Sena Uddha Balasaheb Thakre. That's the name the election commission has given it. The Eknath Shinde faction gets Balasaibachi Shiv Sena or Balasaheb Shiv Sena. The election commission of India has also asked for three options of symbols from Eknath Shinde. So for now, Mashal or the torch will be the symbol of the Shiv Sena, which is called Uddha Balasaheb Shiv Sena. That's the big story, Sahil Joshi, our Mumbai Bureau Chief, joining me with the very latest. Sahil, how is this playing out ahead of a crucial by-election in Mumbai in early November? Which side will today believe that they have got, will feel more satisfied given what the EC has done? Well, both the uh, sides are claiming now that they are uh, satisfied with the name which they have got because uh, Shinde Camp is specifically saying that they always wanted uh, name of Bala Sahib attached with uh, their fraction of the uh, uh, of the Shiv Sena and they have got Bala Sahib and Shiv Sena uh, which uh, translate into English as Bala Sahib's Shiv Sena is what uh, the Shinde has got. Now interestingly both the fractions have given three names uh, to the election commission. The first name of course from both the side was Shiv Sena Bala Sahib. Uh, so of course the election commission finally had to say that because both the fractions have given the first name, Shiv Sena's uh, Shiv Sena Bala Sahib, so nobody will get that name. But the next uh, option given by the uh, Uddhav Thakre camp was Shiv Sena Uddhav Bala Sahib Thakre. So that name was awarded to uh, Uddhav Thakre camp. And whereas the second option given by the Shinde camp was Bala Sahib Shiv Sena. So that name has been given to uh, Ikna Shinde camp. Now, interestingly, this particular uh, you know bifurcation which has happened uh, has happened only for this particular election. If the election commission manages to come to a particular decision, specific decision with respect to the fight which is going on in the election commission. By the time this election happens, then maybe for the municipal corporation election, we may have uh, two different names uh, uh, right. again. Uh, maybe because the main fight is going to be for the real name of the Shiv Sena so and this, the bow and arrow symbol. So that is, is going an, to be very uh, going to be really. Interesting. So this is an interim order, 
an interim order specifically till the final order is decided on who gets the traditional bow and arrow symbol of the Shiv Sena. So the battle of the symbols in Maharashtra, the torch will be the symbol, the mashal of the Uddhav faction. We'll wait and see what the Eknath Shinde faction gets. Thanks very much, Sahil Joshi, for joining me. Let's turn to another of our top stories tonight. Mulayam Singh Yadav, who rode the Mandal wave in the 1990s to rewrite the politics of the Hindi heartland, is no more. The Samajwadi Party patriarch and three-time Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh breathed his last at Gurugram's Medanta Hospital on Monday morning. His funeral will take place in his ancestral village of Sefai on Tuesday with full state honours. Mulayam Singh was a giant politi politician of his time who rewrote the politics for good and bad in Uttar Pradesh. We'll take a look at the legacy and the life and times of Mulayam Singh Yadav. Mulayam Singh Yadav, the Pehlwan from Sefai, practiced politics with moves of a gifted wrestler, a master at gauging the changing winds. He perfected the art of political somersaults, landing mostly on his feet unscathed. Mentored by Ram Manohar Lohia, he became a Samyukt Socialist Party MLA at the age of 28 from Jaswantnagar seat in UP. Since then, he chose many mentors, from Chaudhri Charan Singh to Hemvati Nandan Bahugana to Devi Lal, till he got the stage to himself. In 1989, Mulayam Singh outmaneuvered his rivals in Janta Dal to emerge as the Chief Minister of Uttar Pradesh. After that, he was Netaji to his followers. The VP Singh government's decision to implement the Mandal Commission recommendation of 27% OBC quota gave birth to two parallel political movements. Mulayam rode the Mandal wave and cracked down on the Sangh Parivar's Mandir movement, ordering police firing on car sevaks in Ayodhya in 1990. He carved out an OBC Muslim vote bank in UP, dealing a death blow to the Congress, which never recovered from it. Mulayam became the CM of UP thrice, but never completed a five-year term. The ambitious grappler missed the Prime Minister's post by a whisker in 1996. His chances scuttled by his Yadav counterpart in Bihar, Lalu Prasad. What stood out was his ability to cut losses. Mulayam, who once burnt bridges with Sonia Gandhi by first offering his support in 1999, only to go back to his word, later came to the rescue of the UPA government when the left pulled out, citing the nuclear deal with the US. India's politics over the last 30 years was shaped by Mandal and Mandir. Netaji has left the arena, but the party he formed still remains a strong challenger to the BJP in Uttar Pradesh. But Mulayam's death, one could say, marks almost the end of the Mandal era. With Lalu the last man standing. With Rahul Srivastav, Bureau Report, India Today. So how should we see the legacy of Mulayam Singh Yadav? Joining me now, Yogendra Yadav, President of Swaraj India, at the moment on the Bharat Jodo Yatra. I'll be joined by Atul Anjan, Secretary of the CPI, who knew Mulayam Singh also well. And Rahul Srivastav, National Affairs Editor, tracked him for more than three decades. Appreciate all of you joining us. Yogendra Yadav, how should we see Mulayam Singh Yadav? Was he to be seen as a politician who transformed the politics of the Hindi heartland? 
Uh, Razdeep, uh, a very tall leader, uh, not necessarily in his height, but certainly in his stature. Uh, Netaji, as Mulayam Singh Ji was called, uh, is someone who's remembered so fondly. Not many political leaders are remembered and thought of so friendly, after, so, so fondly. Uh, because to remember Mulayam Singh Yadav is to remember that era of our political life where an ordinary person from a village, a pehlwan, more by choice, <laughs> more a pehlwan, and a school teacher could actually rise up uh, an era in our politics when people actually practiced politics on the ground, not merely on Twitter, not merely on Facebook. Uh, they were actually connected to the people. Uh, an era of our politics when leaders remembered every single worker by name and could connect to them, could relate to them. I've heard hundreds of stories from people about how they went after 20 years and Mulayam Singh Ji just recognized by name. That kind of era of our politics. It also reminds us uh, about that era of socialist politics when socialism had some ideology left in it. An era where uh, those from the backward caste and communities, those who were firmly kept out of power, got an entry, transformed social uh, equations, uh, and uh, tried in their own ways to practice some kind of equality. I wouldn't say with great success, not so much in the economic policy, but at least in the uh, social composition. Uh, and it is an era of our politics where someone could create a new party in a large state like Uttar Pradesh. Uh, without uh, hundreds and crores of rupees. Uh, so these are things I'd like to remember about Mulayam Singh Yadav Ji, uh, more than the positions he held, more than the sure. chief ministerships he held and the prime ministership he missed. For me, these are more incidental uh, because I mean, you have ministers and ministers and chief ministers. But uh, the important thing is the values that people like him brought to politics in the early phase of their life. In the early phase, I must emphasize, because the Mulayam Singh Yadav of the later phase was perhaps much more different. But you're absolutely right. You know, I traveled with him uh, on campaign rallies and he knew the name of every panchayat leader that we would go on those rallies. That was the remarkable aspect of rooted leader. Sharad Pawar in Maharashtra is another one. But Rahul Srivastava has a wonderful story, which in a way aligns to what Yogendra Yadav said about how Mulayam Singh Yadav literally rose from the grassroots. Yes, Rahul. See, Razdeep, there are many leaders, but remember, he was from UP, Razdeep. The Congress was ruling India and Congress was ruling UP. It was the times when the upper caste were ruling uh, the roost and the backwards were backwards. The subalterns had virtually no political say. They were just supposed to vote for the upper caste. And UP was bigger, 425 seats in Assembly, 85 in uh, Lok Sabha. At that time comes a man who constructs a body party from ground, uh, ground, ground up. I tell you a very beautiful incident that what Mulayam, all the poverty and the denials that a backward goes, the first graduate in 60 villages ever since independence. 60 villages in and around Of Italy. Yadavs, of yes. Yadavs. He was the first graduate. Uh, didn't, have, uh, didn't have no electricity, no road to the main road from his village, Sefai. Today it's a model village. Wish every chief minister had done it to his own village. The point is that he used to roll his clothes. He had only one set of white pajama kurta. Roll it in a polythene seat, cross the rainwater drain, wash, and then go to college. He went to college, started teaching in the same college. And one day he went to the owner's house and the phone was ringing. That's the first time Mulan saw a phone. So the owner was, since he was praying, he told Mulayam, phone would how? Answer the phone. Mulayam didn't know how to answer a phone. So he abused Mulayam. Mulayam told me this, that he abused me. So I picked up the phone, scared, because the other side, the person kept shouting, hello, hello. So Mulayam says, I thought he was telling me, hello, hello, move. So I was a wrestler. I couldn't take a diktat from somebody to hello or move. So I told him, tum hello, main kyo hello, and he banged <laughs> the phone down. That was Mulayam Singh Yadav. Yes, I later saw a Rado watch on his wrist. But yes, that was Mulayam Singh Yadav. The Rado watch, of course, came in the Amar Singh era of Mulayam Singh Yadav. And that was the transformation, in a sense, of a Loyite, uh, socialist Samajwadi party leader who in a sense in the latter half became a very different leader but Atul Anjan he could have almost become the prime minister the fact was the left parties particularly Harkishan Singh Surjit were keen on making him prime minister no less in 1997 
but eventually that was stopped some say because lalu prasad we told it others blame vp singh do you believe mulayam singh yadav could have been prime minister rajdeep you know better at that point of time how the things were moving you remember one meeting with us took place in bango bhavan yes where me jyoti basu indrajit gupta and mulayam singh ji was there at the early in the morning at 9 o'clock that was deal to struck but by that time by that time harikishan singh surjit comrade has gone to moscow the deal was to almost finalized but all of a sudden one call came and that changed the whole thing because the call was that if you make mulayam singh yadav prime minister we will withdraw the support that was the congress party and since then it was not it, it could not be materialized you, and then you are you are telling me that the asked, congress what party what happened here to the you are telling me congress party vetoed mulayam singh yadav as prime minister in 1997 yeah Yes, 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 yes. There was also Lalu was also there, but you know the United Front government was supported by, by, by Congress, Congress outside, and because of that, in 1999, Mulayam Singh Yadav didn't support Indira Gandhi to become the Prime Minister. So, yeah, that was one of the reasons. But anyway, that is another part. But as a man, he was friend to all political leaders, even his adversaries. Darshan Singh Yadav was after his blood. and finally he made darshan singh yadav a rajya sabha member i was very close to him used to go whenever or quite often i get to call that from aa jaiye bhai saifa ise namkeen aur desi ghee ke laddu aaye hain we used to take the early in the morning breakfast discussing in international and national things many issues he used to discuss and many use and once he said i am not now agreeing to support this uh, question of indo us nuclear deal i think that is necessary we should support that one that was a turning point where he had a made good relation with the congress otherwise he was always against the congress but as a man as a man as some uh, people say he used to come whenever i used to sit with him hours together as a chief minister as a party president for after half an hour he will go out and meet the people take their papers then come back lay, give the orders and that was his connection with the people right. that was his connection with the masses and that way he used to work and that has made him public i remember but, one but he was also ramkola in devaria on the farmers there was a firing right. whole night he traveled in an ambassador car and next day he morning he went there and we got arrested and he went to the jail these are the some things where he he you was know, a dharti but, but in a way in a way you mentioned Dharthiput. you mentioned the firing may many believe mulayam singh yadav as an opposition leader was perhaps even more dynamic than he was in power questions of course arose over governance in particular since the mention was of firing there will be those today who will see mulayam singh through the prism yogendra yadav of the firing on car sevaks in 1990 do you believe that is was a turning the, point in a way before that he did a very big mistake before yeah. that when once he first time became the prime chief minister in up he did a very big mistake he gave this churk and dala cement factory to the dalmias vishnu hari dalmia and he sent Uh, uh, PSC to get the physically position right. in his favor, and the, when the workers were opposing, there was a firing. Some ha- more than a dozen workers were killed. Our relation with the left parties went wrong with him, very wrong. But later on, later on, it was 1990. Later on, our relation developed when 1996 or 95, when he thought without left we cannot move. You know, Mulayam Mulayam Singh Yadav sir changed a lot of. Center. changed a lot of allies over the years lot of mentors but yogendra yadav that defining image of mulayam singh also firing on car sevaks did that change the politics of india in a way gave the bjp the opportunity to play victim and then take forward the ram rath yatra uh, rasteep the that's true that's the bottom true. line is that firing on your own people is 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 clearly an ad- clearly an indication of governance failure uh, interestingly mulayam singh yadav came from the lohiyaite tradition within socialist and one of the most famous things about ramanoj lohia is that in 1952 
when his own party was in power in Kerala, Thanu Pillai was the chief minister and there was firing. Ram Manohar Lohia was the general secretary of the party in, uh, you know, national general secretary. He resigned in, he, he criticized his own chief minister because they were firing. So clearly coming from that tradition, Mulayam Singh Yadav could not and no one can justify firing on the people. And yes, politically also it turned out to be a turning point. It did give him an enduring support of one community. Uh, but the promise of socialist party, which is to bring all downtroddens together, uh, remained a promise that was not realized, uh, not only because of the firing. The other major thing that happens is uh, inability to keep a long-term alliance with the BSP. After all, if you are a socialist party, uh, you know you cannot possibly have a relationship of uh, confrontation with uh, the most oppressed in the society, namely the Dalits. So Mulayam Singh should be credited with that great a uh, big leap when the SP and BSP came together uh, in 1993. Uh, however, a big leader like him must also share the blame for that alliance not continuing and for the OBC politics and the Dalit politics uh, whose union could have transformed not just Uttar Pradesh, this union could have transformed this country's politics. That did not happen. So big leaders must also take big blames. But having said all this, uh, we must uh, we must remember. I mean, our, our culture teaches us that we remember uh, leaders for the best uh, sure. things they do, the best phase of their life, for the their strength uh, rather than their weaknesses and uh, whatever happened to them later. And Amar Singh episode that uh, Anjan Sab hinted at is of course that. Uh, uh, but having said all this, uh, we. We really are uh, looking at a phase of Indian politics which we would read about only in textbooks. Let me leave it there. You know, for many of us who covered Uttar Pradesh through those turbulent 1990s, Mulayam will be an enduring figure. And yes, that battle in a way between Mulayam Singh and Mayavati transformed the nature of politics of that era and perhaps gave an entry to the BJP to eventually take over the politics. Thank you all very much for sharing some of those memories here on the news today on the one and only Pehelwan, Mulayam Singh Yadav. Mulayam by name, but tough in his political act, acts. Let's then turn to our other big story, hate speech. A BJP two-time MP, Parvez Sahib Singh Varma, sparking off a huge controversy by being found on tape calling for a total boycott which seemingly is aimed at Muslims, calling for a boycott of a community. This is not the first time Varma has made such a remark, but the fact is the BJP is silent, the Modi government is silent, and the police has not yet taken any action on the case. Can an MP get away by calling for the economic boycott of a community? That's our other big focus today. Take a look. जहाँ जहाँ ये आपको दिखाई दे, मैं कहता हूँ अगर इनका दिमाग ठीक करना है, इनकी तबीयत ठीक करनी है, तो एक ही इलाज है। BJP MP Parvesh Varma at a VHP rally in Delhi, spewing hate against a community and calling for their boycott. The MP representing the West Delhi constituency without naming the community made it amply clear that his statement was aimed at the Muslim community. हाथ खड़ा करके बोलो सहमत हो तो और मेरे साथ बोलो हम इनका संपूर्ण बहिष्कार करेंगे हम इनके दुकान रेडियो से कोई सामान नहीं खरीदेंगे हम इनको कोई मजदूरी नहीं देंगे बातचीत सहमत हो asking all to financially boycott them urging people to not buy from them or employ them. It was left little to the imagination who he meant when he used the term them.
This was at a VHP Akrosh rally where anti-Muslim comments were openly made. And while an FIR has been lodged against the organizers for holding an event without permission, no action against Parvesh Varma till now. The hate speech since then has gone viral, with no action taken against him by the cops or his own party. However, this is not the first time that Parvesh Varma finds himself in the midst of a raging hate speech storm. In 2020, before the Delhi riots and Delhi elections, Varma was banned by the EC from campaigning at the back of communally charged and offensive statements he had made in election rallies. आग आज से कुछ साल पहले कश्मीर में लगी थी वहाँ पे जो कश्मीरी पंडित हैं उनकी बहन बेटियों के साथ में रेप हुआ था आज वो आग दिल्ली के एक कोने में लग गई है वहाँ पे लाखों लोग इकट्ठे हो जाते हैं और वो आग कभी भी दिल्ली के घरों तक पहुंच सकती है हमारे घर में पहुंच सकती है ये दिल्ली वालों को सोच समझ के फैसला लेना पड़ेगा ये लोग आपके घरों में घुसेंगे आपकी बहन बेटियों को उठाएंगे उनको रेप करेंगे उनको मारेंगे आफ्टर द कम्युनली एक्सप्लोजिव स्पीच देर इज कम्प्लीट साइलेंस फ्रॉम परवेश वर्मा नो अपॉलोजी नो रिग्रेट विल हिज पार्टी स्पीक और रिमेन साइलेंट लाइक द लास्ट टाइम अराउंड ब्यूरो रिपोर्ट इंडिया टूडे Well, joining me now first is Asaduddin Owaisi, the AIMIM MP, who's called Parvez called for the arrest of uh, Parvez Varma, saying it's a war on Muslims. Mr. Owaisi, you're calling out Parvez Varma, but the fact is you haven't even filed a complaint. No one has filed a complaint against this speech. Therefore, how do you expect the police to act suo moto? When there is no complaint at the moment, no FIR naming the MP. Well, Rajdeep, uh, uh, fortunately for us, Delhi is still the capital of India, mm -hmm. and unfortunate for us is that the law and order is still with the uh, BJP government, and the Prime Minister is Sri Modi, and the Home Minister is uh, Sri Amit Shah. So it is not a question of going and filing a complaint. It is a question. The question should be asked: Can the Delhi police, which is controlled by BJP, will it discharge its constitutional duty of taking action against people who are calling for a social boycott and annihilation of of a uh, twenty crore minorities of this country who are an equal citizen? That should be a question that should be asked to the Prime Minister, to the Home Minister, and to Delhi police. Because it is the second time BJP MP, who's who's an habitual offender, and, and who election commission has banned him for giving a speech wherein he said that a fire will come into your home and will take away Hindu girls and women. So that is a question that needs to be asked. And and unfortunately for us, the government of the day, headed by Sri Narendra Modi, has not discharged their constitutional duty because the message that is being sent out is that. This is the official policy of BJP that our MPs, our MLAs, our RS, RSS affiliate organization people can talk about genocide of Muslims, and no legal action will be taken by the police, which is controlled by the BJP. No, no, but Mr. Oweci, Mr. Varma's pro, uh, supporters are saying I have not mentioned any community. I have not specifically mentioned the word Muslim. I was talking about criminal acts committed by certain jihadi elements in this area. I was calling for the boycott of jihadi elements. How do you respond? Well, uh, uh, this BJP MP is a smart aleck. You know, he's a what we call a, a, a twit, basically. You know, he's trying to to be very smart, but he's stupid, and he assumes that all of us are fools. We are not. Uh, is is a person sending uh, is a street vendor a jihadi, a person selling meat and fish a jihadi? What is he trying to say? This word is used by the BJP and by the RSS to 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 describe the Muslims of India, and 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 what will BJP say now for an MLA of BJP calling Ashwak a pig? Was Ashwak a pig who and all these elements who barged into his house, trespassed into his house? In front of his 80-year-old mother, kills his son. Can you call a can you call a person who's serving in Indian Air Force's father a pig, who's safeguarding Indian skies? Mr. Ovesi, you're saying all these strong words at a time when also we've seen the other unfortunate image of rioting and violence that's taken place yesterday in Kolkata, 
where again so called islamist jihadi elements are being accused of being behind it at a time when santan se juda slogans were raised in jodhpur yesterday during eid e milad celebrations do you unequivocally condemn all this violence all these provocative slogans and want action against anyone whether it's a parvesh verma or whether it's those who resort to these incendiary sloganing would you agree strong action against all hindu or muslim rajdeep i have said it up to number of times on your tv channel anyone who gives a call to violence the law should take its own course they should face the music of the law but unfortunately for us the law becomes deaf and dumb and the law becomes uh, you know lame when it comes to applying it to against bjp mps and mlas as far as what has happened in west bengal it is mamta banerjee who praised rss it is mamta banerjee who praised the prime minister sri narendra modi despite passing a resolution in the state assembly of, of bengal so it is for that tmc government to rise up and discharge the constitutional duty they have failed in in maintaining law and order what happened in jodhpur this question must be asked for sure gelot that he is he is trying his utmost best to save his skin and his chair mm -hmm. but what is his government doing but you know how will you respond mr ovc to the, those who will say parvesh verma is part of a of a cycle now of hate speech where moment religion is injected into politics whether by an asaduddin ovc or anyone else uh it will inevitably lead to polarization parvesh verma is undoubtedly the worst example by calling for an economic boycott but the point is religious identity politics is playing with fire that will lead to a backlash and we are caught in this cycle as a nation now of this communal rhetoric well mr sardesai let me tell you that we me and you are very going to see april 1st 1933 happening in india the extermination of jews which happened during hitler tenure it started with hate speeches then it led to social boycott and the final solution was killing of 5 million jews graham stanton expert on genocide has clearly said this that india is on a path of genocide of muslims in india now this is what is happening in our country hate speeches have happened now it is the second step that is social boycott don't buy from muslims boycott them a, a call for genocide and so this this it is it is april 19 but i hope you agree mr ovc whether it is by hate speech by islamists or hindutvavadis both should be in a way dealt with strictly under the law i repeat anyone who says sartan se juda in public will be treated the same way as indeed those who are calling for economic boycotts we cannot have any more selective indignation when it comes to speeches designed to spread hate and enmity agree or not rajdeep i am not trying to differentiate between such calls which are being made i am trying to impress upon you and all your viewers that who is the party which is in power for god sake please understand this these elements are being emboldened by bjp it is bjp who is in power how can a two term members of member of parliament say this hate can give us hate speech how can a, a, a two term mla call akhlaq a suwar how can those people in that dharam sansad meeting say that take weapons and kill muslims how can you say that and pick and choose the important point which i am trying to impress that it is the party in power that is bjp which is emboldening these elements because they have no fear of law they know for a, for a fact that it is bjp who is in power which will protect them show me one house where the bjp leader's house has been has been demolished show me one case where they have been gone to prison so let's widen that debate on hate speech look at the legal and policing aspects joining me now ca aryama sundaram senior advocate supreme court Shadan Farasat advocate at the Supreme Court and also joining me Neeraj Kumar former commissioner of Delhi appreciate you joining us uh, on the show tonight uh, let's take each of you on that question what will it take to end this cycle of hate speech aryama sundram you've got in parvesh verma someone who's really a repeat offender 
and yet at no stage has the law acted against him. It almost seems it gives him impunity to say what he wants, including an economic boycott of a certain community, which in this case is a clear reference to Muslims. Well, uh, the point of it, Rajdeep, is uh, very simply put, nothing is an offense which can be punished unless there's a statute which makes it an offense. It goes against your very rights under Article 20 and 21 of the Constitution to punish somebody for something which has not been statutorily laid down as an offense. No, no, Section so 153, one minute, one minute, one minute, sir. Section, are, you, are you saying, a. no, sir, one minute, Section 153 and 295, are you saying that a. they do, cannot exactly. operate? Exactly. I am saying you have to bring it within the four corners of that section. What we really need is something far more serious, far more stringent. In 295A, what does it really say? It says if anybody with malicious intent wants to outrage a religious feeling and wants to outrage religious sentiments. So within that broad framework, you can definitely bring in a lot of action, a lot of actions against people for doing so. But the concept of hate speeches and to put an end to it, I don't believe is something which can be cured by a mere uh, uh, punishment with fine or imprisonment up to three years. It is, if you really want to give a message, it has to be far more determined. It cannot be something where you wrap somebody on the knuckles and say, all right, now go on your way. So he would do it again. So, so the fact of the matter is, secondly, mm -hmm. there is no provision that for a second offense, mm -hmm. a prison sentence of a certain period is mandatory. Even that is not provided. So what happens is, as long as you have people who are willing to behave in this fashion, mm -hmm. unfortunately, to deal with such kinds of people, mm -hmm. you need very stringent laws. You now, know, these people, mm -hmm. to we stop them, you need laws far more stringent than they are today. Otherwise, basically, they are not bothered about the law. They are not bothered about being judged. They are not bothered about so, being proceeded under 295A. And that's a sad fact. Okay. So you're saying that the laws simply at the moment are not stringent enough to act as a deterrent. Mr. Farasad, do you believe that the problem lies in the weakness of the law? Or just in the way the enforcement machinery operate, that the Virat Hindu Sammelan can go on conducting these meetings, even though today the Supreme Court pulled up the Delhi administration and the Uttarakhand administration as to why had they not acted on previous such Sammelans where hate speeches are made. See, I agree with the sentiment of Mr. Sundaram that this is very uh, pro uh, outrageous in terms of repeat offenders and they are not easy people to deal with. But I don't agree with him that the law is not sufficient. See, 153B, what he has said, what Parvesh Verma has said is covered directly by 153B. That is to say, and 153BB, uh, asserts, counsel, advises, propagates or publishes that any class of person by reason of being member of any religious group be denied or deprived of their right as citizen of India. That's exactly what he has done. It's definitionally covered by this, right? Now, 153B may not be just sufficient in a case like this. In fact, in my view, mm -hmm. this will even be covered under UAPA. These kind of statement, the law is there. If, if UAPA is used for all kind of innocuous, sundry speeches where it doesn't apply, but in a case like this where one-fifth of the country's citizens, you are actually trying to disempower them and say they should not have economic rights and the rest of the uh, country should stop economic engagement with them. I'm uh, This falls within the UAPA definition. Can he, can he get away? Can, 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 can the MP get away by saying, look, I did not specifically refer to the word Muslim. Can he get away or is that disingenuous? I'm sorry. I mean, anybody who watches that statement, does, does it leave doubt in anybody's mind? I mean, the law is not a fool, yes. right? The law is not a fool. You, anybody who watches that statement knows exactly what he is referring to. The audience has understood who is referring to. The audience response is clear who is referring to. Everybody has understood. Right. So the law is not a fool. So therefore, it's obvious what he has said mm -hmm. is clearly a hate speech against a group of citizens of this country. And it, the, the problem is with the enforcement. Delhi police has registered a FIR without even naming him. It's a real joke. What is the purpose of a FIR? He should have been. The FIR should have named him. The speech is very clear. And action in law should have been taken. You know, that that's absolutely where I want to come to you, Mr. Neeraj Kumar. Because, you know, the fact is, this is not the first instance where Parvesh Verma, a member of parliament, is resorting to this kind of hate speech. This is the same person who spoke during, uh, uh, just before the last election, saying Shaheen Bagh protesters are potential rapists and murderers. 
This is the person who said we will demolish mosques on Delhi government land, raise the mosque illegally built on government land. Now is going to the extent of an economic boycott. And as has been suggested by Mr. Parasat, not named, the others in the same Virat uh, Sammelan, uh, Mahant and others have passed even worse speeches. Yogeshwar Acharya, Mahant, Naval Kishore Das were even more explicit. And yet the uh, FIR is against unnamed persons. Uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> I don't know the details of the FIR and what are the contents of it. But let's assume that uh, there has been an FIR for hate speech and uh, Paresh uh, uh, Varma has not been named as an accused. The point is that mm -hmm. the investigation agencies have the problem when they have to look for a complainant who has to come forward and say, that I have been incited, I have got uh, outraged, or my religious feelings are hurt. So one uh, approach is that the police should be the complainant itself. That is quite possible. But then to prove that it has to, it has outraged the feelings of the other community, and it has outraged to such an extent that it is going to uh, I... lead to communal violence and so on and so forth. That becomes a problem. No, are you, I, are you saying? No, no, are you no, no, saying, no, no, Mr. Kumar? One, I, no, one minute. Are you saying that? The, are you saying that the police can't act suo moto? Are you telling me, or is the police in Delhi taking its instructions from the political bosses who are completely silent? I mean, the Home Ministry, not one word from the Home Minister on this, or indeed anyone senior in the government, even BJP spokespersons are silent. You have again, you have again jumped the gun, uh, Rajdeep. You have not allowed me to finish. Please go ahead. I'm just explaining to you the practical difficulties in a case like this. We see these things on in the newspapers or on television cameras, mm -hmm. and we say that, well, uh, it is inc incitement of religious feelings, and it will lead to communal violence, and so on and so forth. Surely they would. But somebody has to come forward and lodge a report. That is one. Mm -hmm. If the some, nobody comes forward to report, then... The police is well within its powers to register an FIR on its own complaint. Mm -hmm. But then the question will arise, how do you prove that it has outraged the feelings of the other community? People have to come forward and give such statements. Okay. But having said that, having said that, to uh, nip this problem in the bud, the police should act in these cases in a proactive manner and go about registering cases immediately without waiting for any clearances or okay. as you are supposing. It should uh, be seen as a proactive agency of the law uh, and the law and order machinery. But, okay, Mr. Farasad, you want in, to respond? You fact, can I say one thing here? Yes. No, on just a minute. I, I'll get one by one. Mr. Farasad, you were nodding your head. Uh, uh, disagree. I was nodding my head because the requirement for outraging the feeling is a requirement under 295A, which is where you attack the religion. Hmm. But where you are attacking the followers of a certain religion or, or the people themselves, mm -hmm. the test is fully objective. 153A, 153B is objective test. It does not depend on whether you outrage anybody's feeling at all. Mm -hmm. This is not a 295A case. This is a 153A, 153B case. It's clear cut hate speech, objectively speaking. The police does not, and I'm sure there are enough complainants in Delhi. The problem is not a complainant. The problem clearly is he is part of the ruling party. He is a MP from the ruling party in Delhi. And the police is controlled by the ruling party. They will not let action be. That's exactly it. Who controls the police? And therefore, will these hate speeches be allowed to continue? As I said at the outset, whichever community they belong to, we must have zero tolerance now for hate speech. Throw the law book. Put the accused in the jail cell, hopefully in the same jail cell, whether they belong to one community or the other. And all of this, as I said, is coming at a time when communal flare-ups have taken place in West Bengal. Clashes outside Kolkata in Mominpur leading to vandalism and arson last night with a police station also not spared. Typically, it's led to another showdown between the TMC and the BJP. Take a look. Stone pelting, vandalism and arson. Iqbalpur police station in Kolkata mobbed. These are the disturbing images 
from Momenpur area of Kolkata where violent communal clashes broke out late on Sunday night. फास्ट फूड का दुकान था अचानक से वो लोग वो गली के अंदर घुसे और हम लोग अपने अंदर चले गए घर की तरफ अपनी महिलाओं को बचाने के तरीके से उसके बाद दुकान को उल्टा दिया गया तोड़ देने के बाद पूरा जला दिया शुरू हो रहा है बीवी वालों से संसार है कल को पुलिस डेढ़ घंटा नहीं आया मेरा माँ बहन जब उठाया सर हम लोग सब पूरा भगवान का सारा में जिंदा है शनिवार से तो तनाव था शनिवार से तनाव था पुलिस तो यहाँ पर तैनात थी पुलिस तो तैनात है चार घंटा एकदम एकदम कंट्रोल कोई पुलिस यहाँ पर नहीं The Kolkata police claim tension started to simmer on Saturday night after religious flags were put up for Milad un Nabi were allegedly vandalized. Over 38 people were detained for causing the ruckus. West Bengal BJP president Sukanta Majumdar, who was heading to the violence hit area on Monday morning, was stopped by the police and arrested. Ah, my Chingri Ghata mode se arrest kiya gaya, jo ilaake se upadhrit ilaake se bahut dur hai. वहाँ पे 144 फोर्टी फोर नहीं था फिर भी वहाँ पे अरेस्ट किया गया क्योंकि जो कॉन्स्पिरेसी चल रही है पश्चिम बंगाल को पश्चिम बांग्लादेश बनाने के लिए हिंदुओं को वितरण करके जैसे कैराना में कभी यूपी में हुआ करता था ऐसे ही मोमिनपुर इकबालपुर में है कि उस बस्ती को वहाँ से हटा के वहाँ पे उसका दखल लेना चाहते है एक कुछ ग्रुप के लोग एक विशेष धर्म संप्रदाय के लोग Ahead of his detention, Majumdar had alleged the police was not taking any action, even though Hindu houses were particularly being attacked. The Bengal BJP unit has written to the Union Home Minister Amit Shah, seeking deployment of central forces in Momenpur. We have asked the Governor of West Bengal to take notice of the precarious law and order situation in the state. The leader of opposition has also written to the Home Minister seeking deployment of central paramilitary forces because clearly Mamta Banerjee has abdicated her responsibility as the Chief Minister and the Home Minister. The Congress claims both the BJP and ruling Trinamool Congress have destroyed communal harmony in the state of West Bengal. Jitna sampradayik santulan bigdenge, unki utna siyasi lab hogi. Ye ye mante huye, ye log dono chate hain. बीजेपी और तृणमूल दोनों पार्टी चाहते हैं दोनों पक्ष चाहते हैं कि बंगाल में सांप्रदायिक तनाव और बढ़े वाइल द स्टेट पोलिटिकल पार्टी इज एंगेज इन एन एंडलेस प्लेम गेम इट्स द पीपल हु आर हैविंग टू लिव इन अ कम्युनली चार्ज एटमोस्फेयर Situation is still simmering in tension hit area of Momenpur as section 144 has been imposed and uneasy calm prevails in that area raising question when this cycle of violence will end with camera person Sham Sundar Ghosh this is Riktik and Anupam Mishra for India today troubling scenes there from Kolkata let's take a break on the other side We'll tell you why Kerala is mourning God's own crocodile. Only in India. On the other side, you're watching the news today. News without the noise. Notice something new. You've started using a new body lotion. Funny. I'm so sorry for the delay. I was on another call. It just kept going on. Uh, no, Papa. You have been a steam bath. Steam bath at home. Two two sea party cakes. Go do your homework. Seven twenty already. The kickoffs in five minutes. Get all the boys. We have the entire place to ourselves, man. Not working? Of course it is. But I don't want you guys to be using this bathroom. So use the other one. I'm so sorry for the delay. I was on another call. It just kept going on. Uh, no, Papa. You have been a steam bath. A steam bath at home. Two two sea party cake. Go to your homework.
आज भी फेंके हुए पैसे नहीं उठाता खुश तो बात होगी रिश्ते में तो हम तुम्हारे बाप खुद हैं डॉन को पकड़ना मुश्किल ही नहीं नामुमकिन है Everyone's busy finding what's trending. You're busy finding out why. India Today for those who research before reacting. Download the India Today app now. Make your media plans smarter with India Today Live TV on your connected. Let's turn to tonight's only in India story. God's own crocodile and possibly the world's only vegetarian crocodile breathed his last in Kerala's Kasaragod. Babia as it was famously known was revered as a divine figure by many devotees. This is Babia's story. <laughs> A gentle giant adored by devotees. A tourist attraction. Loved by pilgrims thronging the Sri Ananda Padmanabha Swami Temple in Kasaragod. Seventy-five-year-old Kerala temple crocodile Babia, the most famous dweller of the Anantapuram Lake, has passed away. The croc had made the temple lake its home since 1947. Far away from the image of crocs as ferocious predators, Babia was purely vegetarian. Believed to be surviving only on temple prasadam of rice and jaggery offered to it twice daily by the temple priests. There are images of devotees bowing to the crocodile with reverence and even touching it. The animal spent most of its time inside the caves around the lake only to come out in the afternoon. Babia was considered as a messenger of Lord Padmanabhan himself. Babia's garlanded body was kept in a glass container as devotees and officials paid their respects. Babia's devotees have now bid it farewell. Which Shibimol Bureau Report, India Today. Real tears being shed over the death of a crocodile. And speaking of animals, we leave you with an image tonight of a video of an Indian rhino colliding head on with a truck in Kaziranga National Park that's gone viral. In the video, the rhino can be seen colliding with the truck while it tries to swirl away. The good news, the rhino walked back to safety. Assam Chief Minister Hemanto Biswa Sarma said that the truck driver has been fined for overspeeding in protected forests. We hope that rhino is well, as are you. Stay well, stay safe. Good night, Shubratri Jai Hind. Namaskar. Imagine your life without Swiggy, Dunzo, Zomato, Zepto? Well, let's just nod in agreement that life would not be the same without these apps. But can we look at them with a finer lens?